The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to the Mobile Bus. We are on the road. We are in Richardson, Texas this week. This next interview addresses the topic that comes up fairly often about public private partnerships, particularly when it comes around innovation. The guest in this interview will be Paul Volker, who is the mayor of Richardson, Texas. Doug McDonald, who is for the city of Richardson. He's the manager of Office of Innovation and Placement Initiatives. And then Dr. Joseph Pancrazio, who is the VP of Innovation Research at UT Dallas. The topics we cover today in the interview include everything from the Richardson IQ, which is what they call the Innovation Quarter, which is a um, very large piece of land that Richardson is bringing together both established companies, but also startups, creating an environment for innovation, around innovation. And that includes the participation from uh, local universities. We talk about community partnership, the role that community play in order to make these kinds of initiatives that affect citywide, but more importantly with Richardson, region-wide. R- Richardson is a suburb of Dallas-Fort Worth. And Mayor Volker, who I've known for many, many years, he and I were at HP together. Uh, Paul is looking at his role as mayor as being regional influence, not just within the confines of the borders of uh, the city of Richardson. And then um, Joe Pancrazia, we had a great conversation as part of this interview around UT Dallas, uh, the uh, University of Texas at Dallas, very unique university with a very unique history tied to Texas Instruments and the role of uh, the university in these kinds of programs. And we talk specifically about technology transfer, taking intellectual properties from universities and being able to support the launch of companies that then does have a payback. And it's a very unique structure. You are going to want to listen in on that and how to partner with universities for innovation research. So you want to wait, listen all the way to the end. But before we jump into this episode, got a quick favor to ask, like, follow, and share. Like this episode, follow us on social media, and share with others. Let others know about what the show is about. And if there is somebody that you know that would benefit from this particular episode, send them the link. Share it on your on your social media. When an episode comes out, we post it to our social media. You sharing it helps us spread the word. So without any further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Paul, I was trying to think the last time we were face-to-face was probably when we were both still at HP. At HP, yes. As, as the joke goes, the HP mafia is strong. <laughs> I'm here with Paul Folker. Paul is the mayor of Richardson, Texas. Yes. Uh, but you also have a day, well, I don't know, do you call the mayor the day job <laughs> or the other job, the, the other the other job? Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm still a technology guy. I I I moved to Richardson, Texas in 1983, uh, right out of college, and I went to work for Hewlett Packard, and I've held jobs in sales and marketing, portfolio management, corporate development, all sorts of fun things there, and I I worked there for 28 years. Um, I literally started on Campbell Road here in Richardson, which is part of the Richardson Innovation Quarter, so HP was there because TI was there, and Collins Radio was there, and Companies like Raytheon and others were all there. So um, the, the Old Testament measurement guys loved calling on, on those customers. So 
I, I've worked in this area at, at HP, at Ericsson, a British company called Capita, uh, Lone Star Technologies today I, I'm at. Uh, so everything from telecommunications, obviously IT, outsourcing when we when we acquired EDS. I, I was one of the guys that moved over to EDS right at the acquisition. So I've been in this area for over 35 years now. It, it's why am I mayor? Well, you know, the city of Richardson gave me a job, gave me my wife, my kid, my home, uh, a career that I'm proud of. And so it's my way to give back to the community. And I look at the area that we call the innovation quarter, and I think, wow, all of the interesting technology that's come from that area, mm -hmm. uh, the space race, you know, Rockwell and other companies here with, with the shuttle, but going way back. Um, we're celebrating 60 plus years recently where we were the, uh, satellite beamings from Cedar Rapids, Iowa to here with voice and video. Yeah. I saw your social media post on that. It was pretty interesting I mean, when you think about some of the early... innovation goes way back in this area. Right. Right. And, uh, right. you know, Apollo 11, the microwave technology that came out of Collins radio, allowing for the television broadcasts to come from the moon. Uh, we're, we're done in this city. So, so there's pretty neat things historically that we're here and, and we're known as the telecom corridor and, uh, the area that's called the IQ was kind of where all the technology was done. You know, you had your class A office buildings all over the city and the area, but, but the labs, the, um, the dry and wet labs, the, the final assembly, some distribution, things like that. We're all done in this 1,200-acre area. And so it, it kind of, after the telecom bust, which we all got to live through, um, we diversified, uh, which was good for the city to do into other industries and technologies. But that 1,200 acres was always kind of sitting there, and many of us said, you know, it needs a new vision. It needs a new mission. So we decided, why don't we look at innovation? And focus instead of on really large companies, maybe focusing on how can we support the entrepreneurs or earlier stage companies. And so we spent literally four or five years between the Chamber of Commerce and the city of Richardson studying other areas to figure out what did they do in things like land use decisions? How did they work with educational institutions? How did they find capital? and get it excited about the area. Right. So we spent a lot of time right. doing that work. Well, and I think, you know, you were a city council for a long time before you became mayor. Well, no, I was only two years, and then I've been mayor now for over seven. It'll be- Is you in your it, third be, term? Um, fourth yeah, fourth term. Holy smokes. <laughs> I've lost track because I keep, I keep following your, your progress. Yeah, it'll, but, it'll, it'll be 10 years at the end of this term. Well, and you and I were talking before we started this interview, which was around the fact that there's this, belief, false belief, that innovation is all concentrated like in the traditional Silicon Valley. And right. listeners of the show know that I'm I'm very much in the mindset that that is totally wrong. There's innovation occurring all over the world, really. And some amazing things that are going on that people just aren't aware of how much. Like for instance, the the, the history of the fact that the satellite communications from Iowa to, to that came, that was here to Richardson right. is proving the early form of satellite data transmission right. um, and, and proving that out. And then how much of the telecom industry actually got birthed here in, well, the, in, you know, in, the, in the in the Dallas area for, for the telecom geeks uh, listening. You know, the Judge Green's ruling, right when they you know opened up the telecom marketplace. Collins Radio was the Sole, sole provider of technology for what became MCI. Yep. The microwave technology. Yeah, MCI, right? Microwave Communications Inc., so which is the name of it. One other aspect of Richardson that's unique is because of the relationship between Collins and MCI, all these international companies that wanted to come into the U.S. market said, well, let's go to Richardson. And if, if Collins can sell to MCI in a very untraditional way, maybe we can too. So right. that's how the Fujitsu's and the Alcatel's, the Nortel's, and all those companies decided to come and, and put their North American headquarters. 
Right. Well, I want to I want to bring in uh, uh, Doug McDonald. So, Doug, you're the manager of the uh, innovation and placement here. So you've got the unfortunate task of taking the vision and trying to make it real. But Richardson already has had a long history it of has. this, right? Yeah. So does that make it easier or harder, given that you've got at least some name recognition out there? No, I definitely I think it makes it easier. Uh, the support of city council to be able to kind of push this forward and continue to kind of build on the vision that was created mm -hmm. by by all of our stakeholders, all of our businesses, the mayor mentioned, we spent we spent a good two, two and a half years working with the property owners and the businesses to make sure this is the direction we want to take this district. And uh, in, in the support of councils really kind of helped us be able to kind of spearhead that. But the history that we have here at Richardson, that's something I, I continually like to say when I'm talking to new businesses, trying to recruit new companies here to Richardson is that, you know, a lot of cities, especially here in North America, have a problem trying to figure out their identity. What's what's unique about this area that's unique among any other places? Uh, and I think Richardson, our DNA of this kind of pioneering technology, um, the electronic city, as we used to call ourselves when back in the 60s and 70s, as the telecom uh, boom started happening. Uh, and then just kind of the evolution of that with UT, uh, UT Dallas being right here in our backyard um, at one of the leading edge institutions here in North America has really kind of given us a, a leg up. Um, and having having all that kind of background, having what's going on today in the world, makes my job a lot easier. Of uh, doing recruitment for new businesses, doing a lot of the collaboration with a lot of our institutional partners, and just bring, bringing in the right people and the right ingredients to help kind of build this ecosystem of innovation. Yeah, but I, you know, and this is goes back because you know I don't know it's pre COVID. Paul and I were on the phone, and he sent me up some of the early materials around uh, the QT. And the thing that impressed me is there's a lot of places around the world who all are trying to draw like an arbitrary line around a piece of land and saying, boom, innovation happens yep. here. It, it doesn't work. We, we, I, you can prove to all these, you know, Silicon Prairie, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. I went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, not Urbana-Champaign. But they try to draw this boundary around Urbana-Champaign and say Silicon Prairie, right? So what? You can draw a line, put a label on it. Nothing happens. Right. And in this case. You're not doing that. It's different. It, it's a lot different. I think it's one of the reasons is because here in North Texas, next 15, 20 years, we have 3 million more people coming to the Dallas Fort Worth Metro. <laughs> so the entire state of Arkansas is coming to North Texas. So we don't have an issue with trying to recruit folks here. They're already coming. It's, it's more of an internal competition among our internal cities of where are they going to land here in North Texas. And, and I think that's, the uniqueness of our of our location being just the first northern suburb of Dallas, being on the light rail system and being part of the, the DART uh, commuter system, uh, being just its its current built environment, being really open for, for startups and for entrepreneurs. You know, seven and a half million square feet of office flex space here in the IQ. That's perfect uh, real estate for, for new businesses wanting to get their foot in and start. So I, I think it is different here because of the – what we've done to the investments of being um, the kind of premier tech hub of Texas, having our uh, partnerships with DART, uh, with UT Dallas. I'll tell you that the, the partnership we have with UT Dallas, and I know we have uh, Joe here as well. Um, the announcement we've made with them to actually plant a second flag here in Richardson is hands down probably the biggest announcement we've made in the past five years. And having the research institutional partner here in the IQ is it's really kind of helped legitimize our efforts of becoming this premier tech. Well, I think that's, that raises some, an important component, right? Because it isn't just about having office space. It's not just about having, you know, support of local government. But there's a, there's a mix of things that you got to have. You need to have that support, but you also need funding mechanisms. You need people that are willing to put forward risk capital. You have to access, have access, though, to expertise, Right that's now, correct. that can be employees at other companies, right? So grab someone from HP or TI or whatever. But it's also the next generation of tech talent, and that's where the partnership on university research plays an important role. So we also have here Dr. Joe Pancrazio, who who is representing the UT Dallas, which I know I'm gonna I'll jump in here, Paul, before you jump in. It's UT Dallas in, in Richardson, Richardson, which yep. is kind of a kind of a unique uh, naming convention. So you're part of IQ also. I mean, UT Dallas has got a significant footprint here, but also 
UT Dallas has a, an amazing history of breakthrough research that then yeah. itself has also spawned off well, startups, yeah, it, et cetera. Exactly, Phil. And, and I, I can't tell you how happy I'm to be with my friends here from City of Richardson. And it's truly, it's be, it's be, it was colleagues and it's becoming friends. Um, and I'm six years into being here in, uh, in North Texas, enjoying every minute of it because of all the opportunities uh, that people who ask what if, right? right? And we do that all the time. One of the things that um, Paul was talking about was the ability to attract talent from all over the world as part of the history here. Well, we're the 11th most diverse campus in the country. And you know why? Because the families who moved here to make their stake be part of the technology uh, development process that, that is in Richardson. Those are our modern Texans. And we are the recipients of some fantastic kids. And about UT Dallas is 30,000 students. It's STEM oriented. So we're about the sciences, we're about the technology, we're about management. All of those things are really important. 76% of our students are in those disciplines in the sciences as well as in management. Um, you know, with it, it, we've had a growing research portfolio. Uh, and and that, that at the time, our founders, of course, were the founders of Texas Instruments. We were a university that came from industry, right. not an industry that came from, uh, from, from a university. It's quite the reverse. And with it, I think it's been part, Doug mentioned DNA, and that's, that's part of our DNA. And we, we have a plaza to Texas Instruments. Okay, this is... I mean, it's who we are, and we embrace that idea of working with industry on all different levels. Um, now, you know, the, the question of, you know, why we're involved with the IQ. Um, well, at the core of who I am, and I know this through various management and leadership training exercises, I define myself as somebody who loves experiments. And I think every day is a great opportunity to ask a what-if question. If I can ask those what-if questions, the great question we're asking is, can we partner with the city of Richardson to take an area, to revitalize it, to grow and expand entrepreneurship and innovation in this zone, can we be part of the beginning of something amazing? And that's why we're all in on this. And, you know, the, a couple of funny things, and Doug and I have had this kind of conversation before. Uh, we're standing up five centers that will be at, located at the Innovation Corps. Two are going to be oriented towards applied artificial intelligence. What does that mean? What's well, where we're, we have people with expertise or working to solve problems that our customers have right. or the people within industry. Real, real world problems versus, right. versus I've got a technology in search of a solution. A, and I have a theory I want to generate right. that, that probably has no applicability. Right. It's about solving problems with the technology, in this case, artificial intelligence. We also have multi-scale uh, drone imaging, basically, to give, give basically multi-scale information about a particular environment. We have a center for surgical innovation um, and we had one of our original inspirations that involved mobility automation and really connected mobility. And the, the fun thing about this, and this is, tells you about the faculty at UT Dallas, is that we made a call. We said, give us your best ideas. Well, well we had 10 fantastic ideas, and we picked the best five bunch. We've got more to go. There are more groups out there with more ideas. So I consider what we're doing at the IQ the beginning. The beginning of something that's going to be amazing. It's going to be the beginning of getting our students and making, having them to be interacting with members of industry through Capstone or the, kind of the senior year project right. that, that might be interacting and supporting an industry cause. Um, we, our Venture Development Center, which was developed 10 years ago, the inspiration of Bob Robb and David Daniel, former president, um, you know, has really gone and done extremely well. We've had five company corporate exits, and which... In several instances, the university has equity. So we've grown up an awful lot you know, right. relative to entrepreneurship and innovation in ways that the IQ exactly is part of our, our larger plan. And our plan is to never have our flag set anywhere, you know, to never let the sun set where our flag may be. We'd like to expand our footprint throughout the North Texas area, in particular at Richardson at the IQ. Yep. I think uh, both themes here that you heard and you, you touched on it in one aspect it is called the innovation quarter that is 1200 acres but and you're gonna laugh when I, i'll show you we actually call it this um we call it the richardson way i don't know where i got that idea i don't know either but uh <laughs> but but the sub note to that is we plan our work and work our plan right. and it has to do with the people that live in the city 
they're they're engineers. Let's be honest, right? And they want to know what are we doing, why are we doing it, and when are we going to do it? And then they want to measure, are you doing it? Right. Right? So that's who we are from a DNA perspective. When you look at things like the Silicon Prairie, the Electronic City, the Telecom Corridor, the IQ, they've never had actually Richardson boundaries. So even our Chamber of Commerce, which I had the pleasure of being the chairman of, we had this group that we called the, the you know, technology business side. So, geez, what are we going to call this? And it's gone through three or four name changes, but it's called Tech Titans today. It's almost 400 technology companies at a regional level. Now, it's owned fiduciarily through the Richardson Chamber. A lot of the members don't even know that because we take a regional perspective. Right. And because we have so many international companies, I really do get the opportunity on a weekly basis to sit down and think of things from a city, county, state, country, and then global perspective. And we do understand that we live in a global marketplace and we embrace that. And <laughs> UT Dallas exemplifies that global marketplace. Yeah. The students there are as diverse to your point as possible. But even I think what a 30 year graduate student is international. Yeah. Uh, base. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Really it's been fantastic. Yeah. So well, that brings up the good a, a point, right? Because diversity in any context, whether it's employment or it's education, as you're preparing, you know, to graduate, as you look for, particularly in more advanced degrees, masters, PhDs, we're seeing more and more diversity, and it's that diversity that brings in the really great ideas because we bring our entire perspective. We all grew up different. We live different. We see problems different. It somewhat feeds into, you know, well, the, reason, tell, the reason I'm here in yeah. Richardson this week with, with is with in, autism. Inclusion is magical. This right. Week. And, and it, in my argument has always been that particularly with autism is, is in the innovation and creativity space, you want people to look at the, who can look at problems differently. Yeah, yeah. Well, anybody on the spectrum, they look at everything differently. The challenge being is, as managers and leaders, we've gotten this mindset that our staff, our students, are all kind of this cookie cutter. And guess what? They're not. They are not. And the smart ones figure out how to unlock that. And the same applies to the university. Is also how do you unlock that full potential? of every student that comes into UT Dallas. Oh, you know, that's a challenge. Uh, with the, probably the common denominator among all these students uh, is that they're very bright. Um, and especially our undergraduate population, our graduate students, of course, are excellent, but our undergrads are fantastic. And we had a poison pill years ago when we started an undergraduate. This is a program. great story. I mean, it was, it was hilarious in some ways. It's diabolical. It, the only way we could start a, an undergraduate, we started as a, the Graduate Center of the Southwest. I, I'm probably... Don't take me literally, I paraphrase that. But basically, as a graduate school, uh, we were allowed to create an undergraduate program, but it had to have the equal quality that which would be at UT Austin, or the premier uh, flagship of the state. Uh, that was a poison. You know, if, if you think about it, if you want to start, a, you know, to create a startup and say your earnings must be the same as uh, <laughs> Microsoft tomorrow, um, at least in the academic uh, parallel for that, um, instead we would and we bought the talent. We found every National Merit Scholar. We created scholarship fellowship programs. We gave people offers they literally could not refuse. And what, now we have close to 200 National Merit Scholars. That's a big number for a university, a colossal big number. You mean like a big number for Texas? No, I'm talking a big number for the world. And with it, we have fantastic students. Our, back when we used to do these uh, SATs, ACTs, I think that's kind of going by the way the dinosaurs lately. But when we were doing those kinds of benchmarks, our students had median scores that were either above Rice or right below Rice, right, and ahead of UT Austin. We bought the talent, we created a culture of excellence, and people flock to that culture, especially when you have a diverse and inclusive environment. I love yeah. the fact that they, they don't have a football team. Uh, um, <laughs> chess team, we got a chess team. At, well, as, as a mayor, well, yeah. I, I, I would rather not have to deal with that. But, but they do have the world-class chess team, and they recruit from all over the world for those chess players. But to your point about the diversity, whether it's you know, autism and living with so many engineers my entire life, 
I, I know for a fact that a third of them probably were on the As- an Asperger's type person. Right. I always joke about, you know, uh, looking at my shoes or your shoes to see how a, an assertive a software developer might be, but that that diversity is, as I mentioned, not just in our workforce, but in our neighborhoods. So I tell businesses yeah. when I talk to them about coming here, you'll have that diverse talent that thinks different, that approaches problems different in your business. But guess what? You you can tag your marketing team to start thinking. Well, geez, will that will that what we build work in other places? And you'd only have to go across the street to find out one of the multitudes of countries and uh, ethnic backgrounds that we have here to test right. things. So it's, it's really a, a benefit in multiple ways. Yeah. Hey, and uh, Doug, one of the questions I wanted to ask, right, because, you know, again, you're the one trying to st- stitch this whole thing together, right, is, you know, there's a lot that has to come together. We talked about it before. It's not just you know, getting, having local government support or having a great research institute, you got to have risk capital. You've got to get the students to want to stay mm-hmm. in the area to contribute back. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. You know, what's missing from the IQ today? If you had to think about the one thing that you don't have today that you wish you had, that would kind of like really, you know, light the afterburners. What's the one thing you you don't have an IQ yet. I I think probably one of the biggest obstacles that we have right now in terms of selling the vision is showing, having a kind of major hub uh, that we can actually showcase. When you get off the train, you can see, hey, you're you're in a unique area. You're in the front door of the innovation district. That's something we've been working really hard on. Um, You know, I I joke about this during the kind of heat of COVID when everything was shut down. uh, We're talking to Joe through uh, our first kind of Zoom calls and Joe says, Hey, you know, talking about these hubs and kind of a, a clubhouse for innovation, you got this building over here sitting that's kind of vacant. Why don't you let us come over and just occupy it, and then we'll bring in some university talent over there. And, you know, from that one small Actually, Doug, you, you know, Doug, what I said is give it to me, 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 give it to me. And I think we kind of did. Yeah, yeah, I know. So it just wish came true. Yeah, so it's been fantastic. It heavily has, and how quickly it's moved with two large institutions to so get this thing. you need that magnet. Out. You, needed, you do. You needed that magnet of some kind. You do, and I think, you know, we're going to be opening this facility back in uh, probably February, March timeframe, and I think that's going to give us a really good test case of what we're going to be able to produce in terms of collaboration, in terms of partnerships, in terms of bringing the right people to the, to the uh, place to, uh, to help kind of build this out. You know, another piece we're doing right now is at our Rapaho Center Station, I mentioned we're, we're part of the, the Dallas uh, Area Rapid Transit System. We have four light rail stations. We have the new uh, Silver Line coming through. It's going to have a station at UT Dallas. We'll be connecting to our Red Line a light rail. So in terms of mass transit, we're a very well-connected city. And um, at Wash Arapaho Center Station, is actually the front door to the innovation. So right now, you get off the station, you kind of see a surface parking lot. You see some transit activity. But there's not that kind of sense of arrival. And I think the effort we're taking right now with our DART partners, uh, we've just now gone through a really – in-depth process to get a good, good agreement in place. We're going to be taking this to the market and hopefully bringing on a partner for a master developer to kind of really visualize and have that sense of arrival, sense of place that I think it's really kind of missing right now. And I think it's just because uh, this her- area was developed, as, as, as Mayor mentioned, as kind of the supply chain to the larger companies, the Collins Radio, Ericsson, TIs, and it didn't have that kind of walkability, the mix of uses, the residential component. And so this is an area we can actually kind of start capitalizing on and bring those missing uses that are really uh, important for that environment. Right. Well, you know, I've had a couple of guests on the show from other regions that have been trying to create this. My argument is those you need a good mix of large, medium, and small. You don't want all small because they're all struggling and you don't, and you, and you don't get that pull. Medium and large are looking to the smaller companies to be the sparks. Yeah. Right. You know, right. Potential acquisition targets or potential feeders of ideas into if, where. If you look at the original IQ area, it was that supply chain, right? And there were, you know, labs. Ericsson may have had its, you know, North American headquarters uh, in a Class A building, but they had several labs. And the same was true for many of the different telecom companies. But th- they were the a little companies might have like Pilot Fish, right? might have swam around the IQ a little bit uh, to be around those big companies. 
What's really cool about the the new thinking is it's those pilot fish that are every bit as important mm -hmm. as the big whale. Right. Right. So yeah, the whales are important. Scale is important. I want a mix of all of those, but I want to incent those early stage innovation type companies that the big guys are going to say, hold it, I need to be around listening yeah. to what's going on at the IQ. Because to your point, it might be research. It might be an acquisition. It might be, you know, just quite candidly, you and I have been through, I don't know how many different types of products that we've decided not to do, right? But you learn more from the mistakes yep. that are being made out there than oftentimes well, the successes. Well, you know, the point being, if you look at HP, in the 10 years I was there, we did 88 acquisitions, right? So innovation by acquisition is a perfectly valid strategy, mm -hmm. right? Right. And we also funded 240 universities yes. to get that talent, to get the thinking even beyond the startups. You know, you're looking at university funded research that kind of is that one step beyond that hasn't even made it into that startup stage. Right. Thinking about your innovation funnel plays a pretty important role. Well, and, and Joe can speak to this in much more detail than I can, but I remember when I was in corporate development, we were looking at those universities that HP sponsored. Um, UT Austin was one of them, right. but UT Dallas wasn't. Um, and the way universities treat intellectual property mm. and their their knowledge of commercialization, those are really critical to what we think the vision of the IQ is going to be. And what I'm proud of is that it started with Dr. Daniel, yeah, yeah. but it's it continues on at UT Dallas. Commercialization, but also that whole who owns the IQ, I, IP. Mm -hmm. and, and companies can be comfortable that it can start, that light bulb can turn on on that campus, and then you can see it go through the whole process. And that's really what I'm excited about seeing happen. That's the, that's the intellectual property side. Then there's the, to Doug's point, we've got to build a place where that PhD graduate student can graduate and co live. And we hope it's in the IQ where he can live upstairs and work downstairs. And then we're, we're really coming around in the years that I've been here looking at uh, investments. Some of the money that's always been in the Dallas area has gone through a generational change. And the next generation doesn't just look for oil and gas or things like that. That next generation of that, that net high net worth wealth actually embraces technology. Right. So the times that, you know, timing's everything in life, right? So, the university being a tier one institution with great ideas about how to allow intellectual property to move forward, a next generation of investment capital that isn't afraid of technology, and then really bright people and a workforce that we can tap into. I don't know what UT Dallas is. It, it's over 4,500 IT professor, uh, graduates. Yeah, I, I, honestly, it's, amazing. I, it's a staggering number, and and I think that but I'm glad that that uh, the mayor's brought this up. It's uh, we have this Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It's, it's started several years ago, and it's it just crosses multiple multiple um, parts of the educational and programmatic space in the university. It's really changed the culture, and we also uh, have in, in, you know hearing how great the uh, office technology commercialization is, and, and it is. Uh, but let me give you a concrete reason why it actually is something distinctive. We have a, an alternative intellectual property uh, agreement model, even though we're part, you know, we're, we're a state institution, we're a state agency. And so with it, we, you know, the idea that we're going to be able to do work and give it to our sponsor becomes problematic <laughs> because, because we, we're not supposed to do work for the private sector right. okay, without giving it to everybody. Uh, we have developed a unique relationship approved by our Office of General Counsel where we can give the intellectual property to the corporate sponsor. And it, it's a, it frees up all sorts of really exciting opportunities. We're the only one in Texas doing it. We did the hard work to get it approved and created a fantastic framework for implementation. Yeah, you're bringing, back, you're bringing back memories. I don't know if you remember the Dole Act, right? Because the Dole no, Act had the yeah. problem with intellectual properties. And I ended up, I was working with Dr. Phil Phillips, who was in charge of tech transfer at the University of Illinois. Yeah. 
probably the number four universities in the country for research dollars, 297th in the country of tech transfer because of state rules. Oh, that bar the state rules and, and the and, and the, culture too. I mean, well, culture, culture because yeah, yeah. professors are like, well, you know, that's well, I, a conflict I, I, of interest. I'm not going to get involved in that. That's you so, know. So think of it this way: we take people that are at prime, the creative abilities. We tell them, you know what, you can work on a company and corporate stuff. Do that. Yeah, that's not going to count for your promotion and tenure. Tenure, you know, theoretically is a lifetime job. So you're going to mess with that now? Okay, that's yep. the ivory tower model. Right, exactly. and we're beyond that. You know, we, we have a culture where we respect and we include considerations of what impact you have in your science and technology. Mm, that's and big, we reward it. And, and so that is it's, it's a, perfect. It, it is exactly the way you need a great tier one research institution to be your partner. Okay. And to be a partner, it is, we've reached a point now, Phil. We've reached a point now where great universities can no longer stand up and say, we're great, give us money. Right. We have to say, you know, but, what's your value? But this, is, but this also plays out, though, with this issue of the being co-resident, though, in something like the IQ. Absolutely. It's not separate. It's not like I got to go drive an hour away to go have a conversation with researchers. They're actually, you know, 15 right feet away. Co-located. Or, or we're in the restaurant together. We run into each other. The serendipity effect which is really the, the spark that drives a lot of innovation efforts. That's, that's exactly right. You know, it's like a, dealing with large, large companies or large, large institutions, universities. Oftentimes, you don't know what door to go into. Right. But, right. You, but what you need first is to just know where the doors are. Right. You know, um, and, and those things will happen if you can get access. And that's what, you know, we're really trying to accomplish in the innovation quarter is access. You know, it's, it's transportation access. Mm -hmm. It's communications access. It's it's educational access. It's coffee access. We're it is. Need to be caffeinated. Yeah. We, <laughs> so, we, yeah, we, we we have a uh, a podcast of our own that we do uh, that's around the IQ brew. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's a coffee talk around it's. innovation, right? But it it is some place where I am so proud as a council member. We get to people ask what what do, what do city council people do, right? One of the neat things we get to do is create a place. And I've got five or six places we've created in the city of Richardson. One of those places is the IQ. Mm -hmm. And when you create something like the IQ, it's a place you get to create a culture. You get to create value. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not afraid to say we also get to create wealth. Yep. Because that's what drives a lot of these innovative ideas is that opportunity to have that creation of wealth, which gets reinvested back into the institutions, into new companies, exactly. into that workforce that we keep producing that are highly educated and need a place to go. So, well, so that's, instance, that's the vision. The, the, the point that I point out to people with regards to that reinvestment opportunity is, is if you think about Silicon Valley, number, the number one private donator to UC Berkeley. Any idea who it is? Art Fong. Employee number nine at HP, mm. right? For a citizen, Art Fong, being Chinese, couldn't even buy his house in Palo Alto. David Packard bought it under his name for Art because they couldn't buy it back in the, in, in the early nice. 40s, uh, you know, for, for HP. But Art turned around and reinvested. You think about the number of students that have come out of UC Berkeley that have spawned right. other companies. It is this payback effect. You you incentivize, you reward, you recognize, and it comes back. But you got to be willing. This is generational. Right. Part of the, I think part of the challenge we have as a society is we're thinking short term. What am I going to get next month? What am I going to get next quarter? Well, These are long term committed efforts. The the bet that the three of the founders of TI made in in creating UT Dallas was that long-term investment right. view. The Art Collinses of the world, you right. know, uh, coming from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, down to Richardson to create a second plant uh, for redundancy and other aspects of technology they wanted to go explore. It's amazing that if a, a very good friend of mine who will probably listen to this podcast, he knows what I'm going to talk about. We've, we've spent a lot of time looking at the DNA of the area. 
you know, where did people start to work at? What universities did they come from? What companies did they go to work for? What right. companies did they start? It's, it's a fascinating thing. And when we looked at the research that many of the consultants we hired to do for the IQ, we, we looked at best in class. You know? So we said, how did Silicon Valley and relationships with Stanford or in, in Boston with relationships with MIT and others, uh, Research Triangle Park, um, we looked at in, in places in the UK and around the world. And, and we really wanted to understand what success looked like. And that's what we're really trying to create here. Great. As we wrap this up, one, I wanted to thank all three of you for spending the time today. And uh, I'm anxious to uh, be able to actually get to talk to more people over the next couple of days here in Richardson. So okay. thanks again for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. Appreciate it. Now, with that interview you just listened, you were given a number of key nuggets. I particularly appreciated the conversation around technology transfer from universities, but also how you as an innovator can work with local government to get the support, the resources, the infrastructure you need wherever you live. You do not have to be in Silicon Valley. Cities like Richardson, uh, we've had shows on on uh, capabilities even in areas such as uh, rural Kentucky uh, that can support the needs of innovators. Don't be shy. Reach out, build those relationships with local communities, your local uh, government, with local universities. It takes a village. It takes a community to bring innovations to fruition and create those local jobs that are just so, so important. Thanks for joining us today. We really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Your time is very valuable. We never take it for granted. Um, you know, I know how busy I can be, and sometimes I fall behind on my podcast. The fact that you are taking the time out of your schedule to listen, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, so how are we doing? Give us some feedback. We are running a series of shows here on with interviews with outside guests, particularly uh, here in Richardson, Texas, which is one of our first stops of being on the road, looking for local innovators, innovators that have interesting stories, things that they're doing that I think are just interesting to me and I believe would be interesting to you and give you some insights and maybe even give you some ideas or some suggestions with regards to your own efforts. So. How are we doing? Give us some feedback. Post a comment on, on anywhere where you get your podcast. Uh, reach out to us on social media or drop us an email. Uh, phil at KillerInnovations.com. If you have a guest, if you have a city or a location, if you have a place you think we should travel to and meet with local officials and meet with local innovators and local leaders, um, from university, business, technology, government, let us know. We would love to, to replicate what we are doing here in Richardson with other communities, to hear their stories and share those stories with others. Uh, the other thing is, is what questions or topics you would like for us to cover on future episodes? Let us know on that. Before we go, I do have, again, one more favor. Help me pay it forward. This podcast started back in 2005 on the premise that my mentor, Bob Davis, told me I could not pay it back all the time and energy he built into my career that I had to pay it forward. So this podcast started as a way for me to share my experiences, my expertise, my career, what I've learned, the mistakes I've made in hopes of helping you. Help me pay it forward by extending and reaching and finding the broadest possible audience who could benefit from hearing the stories, the special guests, the expertise we share here on Killer Innovations. So I appreciate that. Let other people know. And with that, thanks. We will be back soon with another episode. Bye-bye. Podcasting nonstop since 2005, this has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. 
For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.